Welcome, everybody. Hi there. I am Patrick Curran. And I'm Dan Bauer. And you are foolish enough to join us for a second time on episode two of Center Stat Unscripted. So that's kind of on you and not on us, I think. Clearly, we're not the only ones with a flat learning curve. <laughs> But thank you if you're out there in the live world joining us. Again, we're the intellectual equivalent to a car driving too fast on ice. Is It might be fine, but you just absolutely don't know. Um, and so we appreciate you if, if you're with us live. Um, if you are watching a recording, we appreciate that as well. But we also know you're watching it at twice speed. So we will talk slower. <laughs> <laughs> um, Boy, you really dressed up for today, huh? I am nothing. I'm not professional. Actually, even when I walked downstairs, my wife was like, are you really going to just wear that? And I was like, that was a rough night. It's his dress t-shirt. It's not his regular one. Yeah. I mean, you got buttons, but it's not like you're tucking. N no, I'm not. And we should be happy that you're wearing it's, pants. The norms have adjusted oh, the pandemic. I spoke too soon. Um, Wait, uh, so, no! <laughs> We're going to sit for today. So, all right, what we're going to do is ask for half an hour of your time, and we're going to talk a little bit, whiteboard, argue with one another, and then for those of you who want, hang around for 15 minutes. We got Q&A and making fun of each other, but if you need to bounce to something else, do what you need to do. What are we doing today? Yeah, so last time we talked about how we could move from the multiple regression model to the structured equation model and all the potential advantages and reasons for doing that. And this time we thought we would, again, kind of start with the multiple regression model, our old friend, but then see how and why we might want to extend from that to a multi-level model. So and also if we talk again about the same thing that we talked about last time, we only have to think about half new material. We have a limited corpus of knowledge. Yes, so, quite limited. You know, we got and so part down. of contri contribution from unscripted is professional development. So for those of you going into academia or teaching or dissemination in some ways, just talk about the same thing over and over again, and it cuts your workload in half. Speaking of which, we've taught this multi-level modeling workshop that we do <laughs> since like two thousand. I don't. I don't want to know. I want to say. I don't and know. Before that, anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah, which reminds me, we do have a full workshop on this. We, Some, we, we do. So, oh my God, we didn't look it up. <laughs> it's in June. We are such horrible businessmen. We, we do. We do have. Okay, <clears throat> you keep talking. All right. So, I'm going to look. Okay, if you go to centerstat.org, that's our home, home place. Oh, we got a lot of. We have a ton of classes. These are great. We just don't remember. We just don't remember them. Measurement modeling, causal inference, data visualization, and our multi-level modeling. <clears throat> May 22nd to May 26th. Was I, did that cover it? That sounded good. Yeah. Uh-huh. Wait, are we sure I'm on my webpage? I, oh, no, that's the competitor. I totally remember that. Yeah. Okay, um, but anyway. But anyway, so in that workshop, we go through things in a lot of detail. Here you're going to get like the tight 20 minutes or so of why you might use multi-level models. So we're going to start out with the basic regression model. We're going to use an example that we go through in detail in the workshop. Um, it's kind of easy to, to wrap your head around. We're going to be looking at science achievement scores for kids in high school, right? So 10th through 12th grade or so. And we want to know how that might be related to the attitudes that the parents have about the relationship between science and religion. Right. So our predictor is not religiosity, it's not how religious a family is, but it's whether that family views science and faith as being in conflict and sort of leans toward the faith side. So our predictor is going to be in attitudes toward science, religious attitudes toward science, and items might include things like we need less science and more faith. Right, that's an example of an item on that scale. All right, so we want to know about the science achievement scores of kids, and we want to predict that, and our predictor is going to be our measure of attitudes. All right, so in regular regression, this is how we would write out the model, and we would expect to see, right, we have attitudes on our x-axis, and we have science on our y-axis. We would expect to see kind of a negative relationship where in families where parents have negative attitudes towards science and view science as being in conflict with faith, that we would see lower science achievement scores by the, the kids coming out of those families. So we'd see some kind of negative 
relationship like that. Right, and we could extend this model in lots of interesting ways, and we did some of that last time. We said, well, we could, we could have a, you know, another predictor in there, like a beta 2 for the effect of SES, and we would get a unique effect of attitudes above and beyond SES. We would get a unique effect of SES above and beyond attitudes, and we would also get their joint prediction of science scores. But for right now, I'm just going to say we only have the one predictor. Okay, my hand's not a very good eraser. <laughs> It'll work. All right. You know, it's so, not like we bought math-specific spray. I refuse to use it. I, just, it's too, too kitschy. All right. So, so one of the big assumptions we make in the regression model that we're going to talk about a fair amount today is about these residuals. We assume those residuals to be independent. All right. And what does that mean? It means you can grab any one residual and then you can grab any other residual at random, and there's going to be no correlation between those. There's no relationship between those. So if one residual you know, is for one student, and another residual is for another student, knowing one tells you nothing about the other. Now, we can think of lots of reasons why that not, might not be the case. For instance, recently, Patrick and I realized that we were reviewer one and reviewer two on the same paper. But we, <clears throat> we didn't know it because it was confidential and we shouldn't have been talking about it. We but, had no idea, but... But you told me, I have a line when that I often use that is, like, I write some positive stuff, and then I say, however, there were several factors that undermine my enthusiasm for the manuscript in its current form. And you said you were reviewer B, weren't you? Yeah, yeah. If you ever see diminished my enthusiasm... No, undermined. Like dampened. Dampened? Oh, dampened. Dampened. Dampen. Yeah. The other thing he'll do is he'll be like, Bauer this and Bauer that, <laughs> Bauer the other. And I'm like, wait a minute. He's just trying If you to want to get back at somebody, at write a review where you just say, the author needs to cite Bauer and Bauer and Bauer and Bauer and Bauer and then the authors think Bauer wrote it and it's kind of funny. Yeah, I have enemies I don't even know why. Dude. All right point being all right so we're gonna get back to this example so we're looking at science scores <laughs> all right and we have parental attitudes as our predictor and we have this negative relationship and we're saying grab any student at random and there's gonna be some error of prediction but that error of prediction tells us nothing about the errors for anybody else right totally independent except what if I'm gonna get fancy and use color here. At least you haven't started sniffing, so I give you that. Jesus. Just pull them. You don't screw them. <laughs> Unscrew them. All right. All right, Patrick, that was awkward. All right, so what if we have a whole set of observations here that all came from the same school? Right? And all these observations happen to have residuals that are above the regression line. Right? So this residual is positive, that residual is positive, that residual, right? They're all positive residuals relative to the regression line. Knowing one actually does tell you something about the next one. If I know this is a student in a particular school, we'll just say Chapel Hill High. I don't know why that came to mind. That's a kid from Chapel Hill High. Chapel Hill High is a great school. Kids in Chapel Hill High tend to do really well on science achievement and other kinds of achievement, right? And that also is another kid from Chapel Hill High. Well, notice all those kids from Chapel Hill High tend to be above the regression line. So their residuals are going to be positively correlated. We have blown that assumption of independence because we have kids who are coming from the same school and that school matters. Patrick, would you like to tell us more about why <laughs> it Why, matters? yes, Dan. We'll go to the weather desk. All right, I am going to use the little squirty thing. Um, <clears throat> all right. Oh, boy, it's the same unventilated room, isn't uh, yeah, it? Yeah. I did not think that all the way through. Um, so what it helps to think about is, one, what are the sources where non-independence can come from? Two, what are the implications if we don't appropriately handle non-independence? And then three, what's available to us to incorporate that either to do a fix-up on the back end or to build a model that explicitly allows for the dependent data structures, all right? So what we're going to do is going to lay out, Dan said this in words, but I'm going to write just a simple equation, is, you know what I love about um, mathematical expressions and equations is they are literally an expression of an independent thought using arbitrary symbols, right? And that's language. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. We just say, everybody says, hey, look up here. 
if we see this little weird shape, it's going to make a T sound. And everybody says, yeah, okay, that's fine. All right. Well, an equation is exactly the same thing. It's a statement of an independent thought. And what we're going to do, okay, so I had trouble taking the lid off of that, is we're going to say epsilon sub i. So I have a residual, Dan has a residual, you have a residual, is distributed as, is that little squiggly, a mean of zero and a variance sigma square. And sometimes you will see written up here, IID. Now this is literally, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, but it's saying the individual residuals are independently and identically distributed with a mean of zero and a variance of sigma squared. Isn't that cool? It's just a sentence that we use with arbitrary uh, uh, symbols that we all agree on. Well, here is that independence. I, independent, as Dan said, no two residuals are any more or less related than any other two residuals. And the residuals in their entirety can be captured with a single variance. All right, and in our GLM, our general linear model, whether it be a regression or ANOVA, is this is often referred to as MSE, or mean squared error. That's our residual. And there's one. There's one value. Well, Dan kind of baited the hook of, well, what if those residuals are not independent? That is, if you came from Chapel Hill High, I gotta tell you, Chapel Hill is not great at naming its high schools. Its first high school is named Chapel Hill High. Its second high school, where my children go, is East Chapel Hill High. You're never gonna guess where it is relative to Chapel Hill High. But let's think a little bit about where our data come from, all right? So I'm gonna make this blob, all right? You like this, Dan? Here's my blob. This is blobo, which is the population. I'm really interested to see where this is going. Yeah, uh, you know, me too, because <laughs> I know about as much as you do as to where we're heading. So we've got this blob that is our population. Now this serves two purposes. One is this is gonna be the mothership from which we randomly sample our observations. We're gonna go to the population, we're gonna sample these hopefully in a random way. We could do a, a whole discussion, it's kind of neat of design-based versus model-based inference, but we're gonna say that we just get an independent sample and that's where we get our sample, but then we also wanna fit a model that allows us to make inferences back to the population. All right, so we have this kind of blobo population and let's say here's ID, all right? This is kid, all right? This is ID. And in the attitudes and science achievement, we have kid one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I'm going to do nine, ten, and we go up to whatever your sample size n is. All right, that's whatever the n is. We got a couple hundred kids. Say, all right, the IID says none of these kids are any more or less related than any other kid. You randomly pick two, replace them, randomly pick two, and there's no systematic relation. But as Dan said. Well, what if those kids reside within schools, all right? And so just for simplicity, <clears throat> school one has kid one, two, three. School two has four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and we'll put the 10th kid in, all right? Here's school three. And that goes up to now a second sample size, which is the number of schools. <laughs> <clears throat> schools, I can't draw, it's the, I should recap that, all right? <laughs> but notice two things. First, if this is where our data came from, and we, these really are. They are. They They're really not so are. easy to open. Here, what we're implying is we are first randomly sampling schools out of the population, and then in principle, we are then randomly sampling kids from the school. Now I say in principle because sometimes we do, sometimes we don't, but we pretend we do. We can talk about that on another day. We should teach a workshop in that. We ought to. We ought to, <laughs> whenever that might, might be scheduled. might be sometime. I, <laughs> but notice two things is one, now we are gonna make an assumption. We're not gonna talk about it in here uh, today, but we make an assumption now that one, the kids are actually independent within school, 
right? That there's a variability in there. But the schools are now independent of one another. Right? So we roll up that IID assumption to the school level. And so this is option one of where we violate dependency is what's sometimes called, called high, higher hierarchical. Yeah. You're not helping at all. Hierarchical. Like, <laughs> Do you need to tap out? Dude? <laughs> no, I'm like, no, I'm fine, seriously. But it's by structure. So imagine you have kids in school, you have siblings within family, you have multiple patients nested within therapist. Like when Dan and I go to couples therapy. The only Don't way you side. That was the number one thing that Dr. Dr. Michelle said to not do is sigh. You sigh. Okay. I'm just going to gaslight you now. I'm a better person. Don't gaslight me. Where's the other way that this could come from? Well, what if we really did have an independent sample of kids, but within each kid is time? I don't know why I can't write today. Time one, two, three, and so on. So we can use or a source of, of structure of dependence in the data can either come from hierarchical data, it can come from repeated measures, longitudinal data, or what we can talk about on another day is it can come from both because you can have time within kid and kid within school. Now, super quick, that's where it comes from. Two, what are the implications? It biases our test statistics. Why? Oh, I erased it. Why did I erase it? I had a really nice sigma squared and, and MSE. Remember my mm. sigma squared here that I called MSE? Well, that's wrong. If one of these structures exist and we don't allow for it, there's not one source of variability. There are multiple sources of variability within school and between school, but those are all smushed into one sigma squared. The other is, we have a massively lost opportunity on what we can test. Because when you break it apart to school and kid, we could have school predictors, and we can have kid predictors, and we can have school by kid interactions. We Is that my point? That's your point. All right. Yes. I don't imagine you want my blob. I am thankful that you're erasing it instead of me. <laughs> so. What do we do, Bauer? All right, so we're going to see how this plays out with our, our example data. Can you race faster? I cannot. I need the board. I had rotator cuff surgery on my right arm, and I'm yeah. right-handed, but I can't use my right arm, so I'm a little slow. Yeah, that's why he writes on the whiteboard. Like that. <laughs> and I have T-Rex. I have T-Rex hands. <laughs> all right, all right, so back to the point. I think. <laughs> do we uh, have a point? Do, do we? Wait, what are we talking about all right, today? All right, all right, all right. So, oh, it's that spray. So Patrick talked about how there's multiple sources of variability running around in our data because we really have multiple levels of sampling, right? We've got schools, and then within those schools, we've got students. And so earlier when we had drawn this out, right, we had attitudes on our x-axis and science on our y-axis, and we said we just got a bunch of observations here, and there's a regression line, right? Well. That mean squared error, that sigma square that Patrick's talking about, is in the regular regression model, we assume that there's, at any given level of attitudes, there's a distribution of values of science achievement, and that distribution is characterized by a single variance parameter, that's our sigma square. Right? We're assuming that we're taking independent draws out of this distribution, right? maybe it's over here, maybe it's over there, but we're just taking independent draws out of that conditional distribution. Well, now, we're saying, I need the towel. You said you didn't need it because it was kitschy. I don't like the, no, I don't like the spray. The towel is fine. I'm okay with the towel. You are such a complex man. I am, I am. All right, so now we're saying, hey, there might be differences across schools in levels of science achievement, right? So earlier we circled a few of these observations. All right, I'm gonna put another one on there. And we said all those kids came from Chapel Hill High. Well, what if we let Chapel Hill High have its own regression line? Right? We're going to allow it to have an intercept that's higher than the average regression line. And maybe we've got a set of observations from another school that's down here, and we let it have its own regression line. That's another source of variance in our data. So now we really have two sources of variance in our data. We've got a distribution of regression lines, 
right? And that's going to have one variance component associated with it. And then within any given school, we're going to have these residuals from the school-specific regression line, and they're going to have their own little distribution, right? So we really have two different sources of variance running around in our model, in our data. We've got these between school variation and average levels of science achievement, and then we've got the within school variation in you know, student to student variability in science achievement. All right, so we've got these two components of variance that we need to capture in our model, and with multi-level models, we can explicitly include a different component of variance for each uh, source of variation for each level of sampling in our data, right? So we can kind of get a sense of what that's going to look like, right? We've got attitudes here, we've got science there, and we've got a line for one school, and we've got a line for another school, and we've got a line for another school, right? Each school gets its own line, and most of them might show that negative slope, but some schools might have a different slope, right? They don't all have to show exactly the same relationship. Right, so we can see there are school differences in the relationship and level of science achievement and its relationship to attitudes. And then, of course, you could pick any one of these lines. And if I can get the cap I off this damn marker. I can't mock him anymore. Jesus. Well, I'll find something else. All right, you but. could pick any one of these regression lines and plot the students within that school and see that within school variability. All right, so we're now explicitly accounting for both within and between school variability and the regression lines. Am I missing anything, Patrick? Lay in the fixed effect. Yeah, yeah. So we've got school-to-school -school differences. No, use right. You just want to see me try to get the <laughs> so we've got these No, green. These no, blue. Ah! <laughs> we've got these school-to-school -school differences, and we may be interested in the average regression line, and in multiple modeling or mixed effects modeling, the lingo for that is that's going to be described by the fixed effects, right? Which are kind of like your regular regression coefficients. But then around that average, we're going to see this variation in school-specific regression lines, and then around each school-specific regression line, we're going to see variation in the individual scores. And that variation is captured through variance components in the model. So we estimate fixed effects that are a lot like the regular regression coefficients that you're used to for multiple regression. But then we're also going to estimate these variance components. And unlike in the regular regression model, where we just have one sigma square and we're assuming everything is independent, now we've got two components of variance to capture both the between school differences as well as the within school differences, right? And that's where you start to get into some really cool stuff is parsing that within and between variation in your outcome and beginning to look at predictors of these different components uh, of variation. So, I will pre-uncap is that's where things start really getting fun. Do so need, one is, help with that? I'm, I'm fine, thank okay. you. I mean, I know you got that one gimpy. On I, I No, I'll just T-Rex it is, no, I literally went to physical therapy this morning and I can raise my arm like here. Isn't that good? So. We're nothing if what, not supportive of one another. Zip, 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 is, so this is really cool. All right, we talked last week about how to a fault I write papers like Agatha Christie. And so first we had this, but wait, there's not one sigma square. There are actually multiple sources of variance. All right, so I do that to a fault, but it has the added advantage of being pretty cool because what we can do is start to tell a story. And we can say, we do have some observed total variability in science achievement across all of our kids. Then we can say a portion of that can be attributed to between school differences and a portion to within school. And we can take a ratio of between to total and get what's called an intra-class correlation. And on another day, we can talk about what that is, what it represents. But if you have truly independent data, an intra-class correlation is zero. That means there is no group level variability because no groups exist. And as the ICC gets higher in value, then you get a 0.1 or a 0.2 and you say of the total variability observed in scientific achievement, 20% was due to between school variability. All right, so I'm going to do, Dan, I'm going to break a huge rule of my own, which is I'm going to write equations without having thought about them myself, mm. is I'm going to say the <clears throat> equation that Dan started with 
with science sub I. All right, we're going to do a Sesame Street thing with the little, you know, bouncing ball. And in multi level models, subscripts become super important. All right, so it's kind of like a luggage tag is who owns this value of science? Well, individual I does. And Dan said, well, it was a function of some beta naught, which is the intercept, plus some beta one times attitude, four person I plus epsilon sub I. All right, so notice there's a single beta naught, a single beta one, because it's independent. We only have one intercept and one slope. But science varies for individual, attitudes vary, and epsilon, the residual varies. Are right, you ready? Like, I almost got tenured on what I'm going to do next. And you know what? It's so important, I'm going to change to red. Are you ready for this? If we have individual I and school J, we actually need a more complicated luggage tag because we need to know what school is each child in. Are you ready for this? Here we go. This got me tenured. It's not psi sub i, it's psi sub i j. Because it's kid i in school j. Well, it's attitude i j, and it's epsilon residual i j. But as Dan just really nicely said, each school has its own intercept and its own slope. So, holy crap. We get to make the intercept and slope a random variable. So what that means is, is I can now write an equation for my intercepts, and I can write an equation for my slopes. These are the fixed effects that Dan was talking about. That is, on average, what is the intercept and what is the slope? for the sample, but these deviations, u0 and u1j, indicate how discrepant is a given school from the average intercept and the average slope. These are the random effects, and we get variances of those. So where do we get the different sources of variance? Well, there's a within group variance, and there's between group variance. These aren't the variances, they're the deviations. The epsilons are zero sigma squared, and the u's are actually um, multivariate normal, because there are a pair of them, zero with covariance matrix T. And a more uh, detailed class would go into that. But Patrick, but, Patrick, I noticed you only have attitudes for the within variance. So, but might it be possible that attitudes differ across schools too? Well, once I get there. Sorry, I just we're running short. I know we are running short. But you know what? People get exactly what they pay for. Is <laughs> don't you know it? We don't <laughs> you know it. Well, here's a hankering that none of us can say no to, which is, well, gosh, if some schools have higher or lower intercepts. If some schools have steeper or less steep slopes, could we bring in school level predictors to try to understand that variability? Is there a characteristic of the school that separates those or predict those that are higher versus lower in the intercept or steeper versus less steep? So imagine school size, school socioeconomic status, rural versus urban. Right? This is where we can separate person level within predictors. Right? So here we have attitudes for the kid predicting science of the kid. We could have other characteristics of the child, their grade, their age, whatever we might have. But we can bring in characteristics of the school as well. But we can even do one better. And I know this is weirdo, but it just is weirdo. In a given school, there are a set of kids who each have an attitude score. We can add those up and divide by how many kids and get a mean attitude that is actually a characteristic of the school. And we can bring in as a predictor here the school level attitudes. I know that's not written well. It's rotated 90 degrees. But now we can say, well, what is the relation between a child's attitude and a child's science score, 
while at the same time evaluating what is the relation between the mean of the school attitudes, so schools are higher versus lower on fundamental attitudes of the students who attend, and the school's average science, and the relation between attitude and science. As soon as we break this into two parts, we're like off to the races. So where would we go from here? Well, you might include some school level predictors in addition to the individual level predictors, and you could even have interactions yeah. between those school level variables and individual level variables. And that gets you into some really cool stuff, not just because we've done some work in that area, <laughs> but really cool stuff on cross level interactions and how do you go about evaluating cross level interactions. Um, and those are really substantively interesting because they, they're like person context interactions. Yeah. You know, does the same context act differently on people who are different from one another? Um, it just gets really interesting to look at those kinds of interactions. Exactly. So what you're asking is it's not just the child's attitudes predicting the child's science. But what are the impact of the child's attitudes given characteristics of the school in which they are embedded? So two kids in separate schools could have the same attitude score, but those have differential predictions as a function of the context of the school. If they are more fundamentalist in a less fundamental school versus more fundamentalist in a more fundamentalist school, that may moderate the relation between student attitude and student science. <clears throat> and then we could do all sorts of things. This is a single time point. Instead of having one science score, we could have repeated measures throughout a year and have trajectories of science scores. That's a three-level model. We could have kids in classrooms and classrooms in school and then separate kid-level predictors from teacher-level predictors from school-level predictors. We could have a cool thing called cross-classified. Steve Roundbush did a really neat thing where there were um, kids nested in neighborhood but not school, kids nested in school but not neighborhood, and then kids who were both in neighborhood and school. So there's not a clean three level, no. but you can look at the main effect of neighborhood, the main effect of school, and the interaction of school and neighborhood. I'm actually doing one of those right now. We're kind of looking at our merit review procedures, and we currently use a round robin design where every rater rates every faculty member. Good. And so you have a perfect cross classification, and I'm looking at how much of the variance in ratings is associated with who's being rated versus who's doing the rating. And then there's a the pretty large noise component that we just won't talk about. But. More importantly, you determine my merit raise. Yeah, I'm going to have to adjust the program, and I'm going to put in a little if-then statement. So good oh, luck. boy. Good luck, buddy. Okay, so we do have a, a workshop on this. You can get it pre-recorded or live, and it's in May. Go to centerstat.org next week. Next week is latent curve models. Latent curve modeling. So we've talked about moving from regression to SEM. We've talked about moving from regression to multi-level, both last week and today. We talked about these things can easily be extended to repeated measures data. And there are many ways of going about doing that. And next week, we're going to introduce the latent curve model. And what is it? What are advantages, disadvantages? Yeah. And we probably have a class on that at some point. It might be in May or June. <laughs> it's it's definitely you, either in May or June. If you want to see Patrick get excited, and you haven't yet, I mean, this is I, baseline. Um, this is baseline. You know, tune in for Leighton Kerr models. He, he gets really juiced up. Okay, so I can do impersonations. Here's Dan excited. All right, here's Dan really scared. I can do this all day. Um, so we can That's stay. That's why we have marital counseling. <laughs> this is what. It's couples. It's couples counseling. Work spouses. What can um, we do? Yes. So that's what we got uh, in terms of whiteboard stuff. But since <laughs> you and I really don't do anything yeah. during our day, um, we can hang around if there are a few questions. But uh, other people have real jobs that they need to go to. And so, no. um, but we've got. Uh, can I pitch you one? You're going to ask me one? I am. Um, there was a request for greater clarification on the difference between fixed versus random effects. 
All right. Or if you'd rather I could. But. Yeah, go for it. I've been talking a bit. Yeah. It's really just a mean and a variance, and Dan will occlude it more. Yeah, I'll here. find ways to make that really. <laughs> you know, to get tenure, we have to make it seem complicated. Yes. Yeah. Never use a monosyllable word when you can use a multisyllable word. So a fixed effect is going to have a single value. And it's going to be the same value for everybody. And it's a lot like a regular regression coefficient, right? You run a regression model and you get a slope estimate. And that slope estimate is the same whether you're talking about Patrick or you're talking about Dan or you're talking about Sue or you're talking about Melissa, right? For the entire population, there's that slope value. And it just has a single value associated with it. And in the notation that Patrick has up here, these are the gammas, right? The gammas describe the average intercept, the average slope. They trace out the average regression line. And they're just going to have a single numerical value. Each. And notice they're subscripted by 0, 0, and 0, 1. Those are just postal codes. They're not luggage tags. Does that make that sense? That makes no sense at all. Um, there's no I and no J. Better. There is a single gamma not not that holds for everyone in the sample. There is a single gamma not one that holds for everyone in the sample. Yeah. So we're used to those, right? We're used to regression coefficients. They have single numerical values. What's new are these U terms, right, that have the J subscript. And they do vary across units. So we do get different intercepts and slopes across schools. And what makes them different from fixed effects is that we don't estimate their values directly. We assume that they come from a distribution, right? So the lines up here are a sample from some bigger distribution of schools, right? And we estimate variance parameters and covariance parameters associated with the random effects because we want to understand their distribution in the population. So that's what Patrick was trying to get at over here is that our residual is also a random effect. It's at the level lowest level, right? It has unit subscripts, and it has a variance sigma square. Now, we have something like that in regular regression, too. But now we're going to add to that variance components for our upper level of sampling, our schools. And so we need to estimate variances and covariances, right? So your fixed effects are like your regular regression coefficients. They're going to have single numerical values each. Your random effects are things that vary across units of sampling. Right? whether it's individuals within schools or it's across schools, and we're going to estimate variance and covariance parameters for those. We don't estimate u naught for school 1 and u naught for school 2 and u naught for school 3. We estimate the variance of u naught across all schools. So how much variance is there in the intercepts of these now, one of the beautiful things about this framework is it just scales up. So everything that Dan said is level 2 is our highest level of nesting. Well, what if we have kid I in classroom J in school K, right? So now our luggage tag has three values to put that kid in the room. Well, everything scales up where now this would become gamma not not K and gamma not one K because now they're they're unique to classroom that varies across school. And there'd be a third set are you ready for this? Again, that people pay us to do this. Gamma not 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 and gamma not not one. And those are the averages across kid and across classroom. Now, Anastasia has a great question. First, I love that name. Second, how can we compare random effect models that are not nested? Does comparing AICs still work? Yeah. Eh. If you know what end plug in for these things. Um, AIC just involves the number of parameters penalty. I tend to use BIC, which involves both sample size and number of parameters. And there are some other information criteria as well. And yeah, you can use those just as you would for other kinds of non-nested model comparisons. Um, you know, usually they're scaled so that smaller is better. But a lot of times we actually are comparing nested models, you know, and so there you can use something like a standard likelihood ratio test to evaluate whether, you know, the more complex model is worth the extra parameters. Um, What'd you do with my... I've got it. <laughs> <laughs> this is, he has such control issues. Um, talk for 30 seconds while I clear this. Is, I'm going to address the next question in there. Tell what the question is the, about the moderation. Curious how you might write the model to account for a moderator contributing to non-independence. All right. So one of the things, and you don't see this a lot in how people talk about it, but it really is kind of neat how it does. I'm going to put the towel over here. Um, 
is, you can just bring your own towel. I mm -hmm. brought that from home. Okay. Is um, what we're trying to do is build a model to make the end or the dependence go away. We're trying to explain the dependence through a model. Now, I'm gonna do this quickly and I'm gonna do generic. I saw that, dude, <laughs> I have eyes in the back of my head. Is we're gonna have y sub i j equals beta naught j plus beta one j x sub i j plus epsilon sub i j. That's a single level one predictor in level one. Beta naught j is gonna be gamma naught naught plus W, whoops. Boy, you're right, that doesn't work. Would you like a towel? I, I had one. <laughs> Again, if anybody wants to co-host co one of these things with me, give me a call. Is gamma naught one WJ plus U naught J, and we got beta one J plus gamma naught one plus gamma, oh, I did not one, gamma one equal, one WJ. E equal sign, not plus sign. Okay, I'm not going to erase it. I learned fool me <laughs> once. Plus U1J. I know that this is a train wreck, but I don't care. Is this level one and level two distinction is super great. And this is kind of a Roudenbush and Breik um, separating these. This isn't actually the model that is estimated. What we do is what's called a reduced form model. Notice beta naught is on the left side of the equal sign here, and beta naught's on the right side of the equal sign there. So what we can do is we can do elementary school math, right? One of the deals we all have in doing this with you is that you promise not to tell other people how easy it is to actually do what we do for a living. That's part of the scam. All right, we're going to replace that, put this here, there. All right, look at this, man. I'm gonna. Where's the green? Didn't we? Have I don't a green? know where the green went. I think you, you threw it. it. I. You have throw such it. anger issues. All right. Now beta one is gonna go here, but notice this: all of beta one that's here gets multiplied by x. That's our cross-level interaction. So it's a little weird is in the level one, level two expression, there's a main effect of X and there are two main effects of W, but there aren't really. There's a main effect of W that comes here, but here this gamma not, this gamma one, one W is multiplied by X. So I won't do the um, random effects, but I will just say that we can have Y sub I J is going to be gamma naught naught plus gamma naught one W plus, what do I got, Bauer? Gam I missed one. Oh, gamma naught naught plus gamma naught one, gamma one W plus gamma, I'm looking for the main effect. That should be a one. That's what I get. So what we do is, is I have is another gamma together, X plus ears. gamma XW. All right is I apologize, I blew an early subscript and then it radiated through. But notice we have a main effect of W, a main effect of X, and then an interaction between X and W, and that's what we call the cross level. Why? Because W and X are in different parts of the model. Now, we could do just like we do in regression, we could have X1, X2, X3, we could have interactions among them. We could have W1, W2, W3, we could have interactions among them. Those are within level interactions. This, which I really couldn't have confused more than I did, is the cross level interaction. Very nice. Is it okay if I use the towel and... I thought you, we could do one more. You got one more, just go so for it. So the last one was a question about um, logical paradoxes. So things like Simpson's paradox and ecological fallacy. And That's a hard one. I'm not gonna do like a super long treatment of this. Good, because you've got a minute. I got a minute. I got as many minutes as I We want. do, we I mean, can do this on. all day if we feel like it. I don't teach class right I don't do hours. anything. I have a meeting Monday at nine. All right, so Simpson. <clears throat> All right, everybody knows who Carl Pearson is. Pearson came up with the product moment correlation, right? So that's our usual correlation. Well, Simpson was a contemporary of Carl Pearson's and said, hey, Carl, I don't know who he spoke. <laughs> Dr. They were buddy. Dr. Pearson. Carly boy. All right, so we're all used to thinking about that correlation as we've got a bunch of data 
right? Easy on the pen, those are new. And it has some positive relationship and the correlation is supposed to summarize that, right? Well, Simpson came along and said, well, you know, Carl, what if there's no relationship at all between two variables, right? So we just see, is that better, Patrick? I'm not banging it. So Thank hard. you. Right, what if we just see all the data here and within that group, there's just no slope at all, right? But there's another group out there that's just higher in its average values for both X and Y, right? So its data is over here. And also in that group, there's no relationship. But if we fail to recognize that we have these groups, these clusters running around and data is coming from cluster A versus cluster B, and we just fit a standard correlation, well, it's gonna look like there's a positive relationship. And we're gonna tend to think that that holds at the individual level when it doesn't, right? It's a total effect as opposed to a within group effect. And so if we had more time, we could go into detail about the differences between total effects, within group effects, between group effects. There are basically three different kinds of effects one could estimate. The total effect just pools over all the data, ignores the cluster structure and says, what's the effect? The within group effect says, if you looked within a specific group, what would that effect look like? So here it would be zero, right? And the between group effect would be looking across the groups in their average values, what's that relationship? And there are all kinds of logical errors where people say, the total effect, right, they get an estimate of that, and then they attribute it as though it were a within group effect. Or they get a between group effect <clears throat> and attribute it as though it were a within group effect. So this is Simpson's paradox, taking the total effect but misattributing it to the individual level. Ecological fallacy is taking a between group effect and attributing it to the individual level. And there's also like a Robinson's paradox. There are a bunch of different paradoxes, but they basically just all involve getting an estimate of one thing but interpreting it as something else. And one of the nice things about multi-level models that again, if we have more time, we can go into more detail about is that we can partition up these effects and determine exactly what is the within group effect versus the between group effect. So going back to our running example is you can imagine, you know, within a given school, students whose parents have more kind of anti-science attitudes, those students might do worse than other students in the same school. That's a within group effect. But if you have a community where everybody holds these attitudes, right, that might be embedded in the curriculum. Right? And so maybe all the kids in schools within those communities with higher attitudes do worse. Right? And so you could have a between school effect as well. And this is one of the biggest advantages of the model is being able to separate these effects. There's a great question we don't have to dig into, but you know, looking at clustered standard errors or GEE models. And so Peter asked that and, and I appreciate that. We don't have time to go into it. Those tend to be considered kind of fixing up on the back end, is if our standard errors, if our MSE, if our degrees of freedom are wrong because we violated independence, we estimate the model and then we go in at the back end and fix the standard errors and we fix the mean squared error and we fix the degrees of freedom. And it actually works quite well as long as you don't have this total between within distinction because if you really have a between within as Dan is describing and you use say robust standard errors, you're getting corrected standard errors for the T, the total effect, when you really wanna break these apart. So there are absolutely circumstances where we wanna go in on the back end and fix things up and those work really well. Dan McNeish has a great paper on this in Psych Methods. Uh, he had a very, uh, uh, I was teasing him about it, is uh, the three of us have worked together, uh, uh, Dan and Dan and me, and um, it was, he has something that's like the unnecessary ubiquity yep. of multi-level models or something, and it's a wonderful paper that goes into these back-end fixes, um, and you know, his main argument is a really, really good one, which is we invoke a lot of assumptions in the multi-level model that might not hold in a given sample, whether it be in size or in distribution or in our confidence in the proper parameterization of it. And so even though we might want to do something like this, we don't have the characteristics of the data that allow that and allow these maximum likelihood estimators to come online in the way that we expect. And so those back-end fixes work really well. But I'll end on a terrifying note, the one that you always tell me, is this is between group. You can also have within between person effects within an individual. And there's a very 
a clearly established effect is that for individuals who exercise more, you are less likely to have a heart attack than if you exercise less. That's a between person. But within is you are much more likely to have a heart attack while you are exercising than not. And so you have a positive between effect, you have a negative within effect, uh, negative and positive. You're less likely to have a heart attack if you exercise more, you're more likely while you're exercising. And if you aggregate those and don't separate them, it shows no relation between exercise and heart health. But we are and over time. Importantly, if you don't collect the nested data, if you don't collect the repeated yeah. measures, you can't pull them apart. Yeah. So just, it's, it scares you a little bit to think of how much psychological research is based on a single yeah. observation per person. And then people are you know, waxing poetic about within person relations. Well, you haven't really separated the within from the between if you do that. Yep, and we'll scare the crap out of you more on that point next week when if you don't separate this in group data, well, exactly the same holds with repeated measures data. And if you only have an individual cross-sectional observation, you're not able to separate within person from between person because it's a little tiny Trojan horse that stuffs all those together. It's only when you take those over time that you can start to look at that. But we should really stop. You ourselves. always have to get the last word, don't you? Was it me? It wasn't me. No, I just, it was just an observation of mine. Thanks, now, everybody. Now I can't say anything. <laughs> See you next week. Bye.